SJC 10018, Commonwealth versus Joseph Spinucci. Good morning, Mr. Hanafi. Good morning. May it please the court, um, I am Joseph Hanafi. I represent appellant Joseph Spinucci. Um, <clears throat> the trial evidence supports our position that provocation arose in this case from sudden combat. Isn't the only evidence that um, at best Mr. Uh, Sullivan, the decedent, uh, jumped your client? Nothing. That is partly correct, uh, Your Honor. The, um, I submit that there's a more complicated overview of this case that um, it is true that the allegation is that um, Ryan Sullivan jumped Joe Spinucci. But our position is that he didn't just jump Joe Spinucci, he jumped him from behind. And that he was able to throw him off right away. He was able to throw him off. We don't know how long it took him to throw him off. We know that Ryan was on Joe's back at least for enough time for, for Danielle LeBlanc to see that and to see that it, he had to throw him off. The, the um, um, and so, I, I submit that that's a moment of sudden combat. This was at what dark. Threat did, I'm sorry? Uh, what threat did the unarmed Sullivan present by jumping on his back? That is threat of serious harm, let's say. I'm sorry? What threat of serious harm? That's what the cases require. Well, yes, it is. But I would, also, I, I would also say that jumping on someone's back at night on a, in a public location causes the, the person who is jumped to devolve into a position of fear. By this point, he had already stabbed Billy, and the co-defendant had stabbed um, Jules. So you're saying at this point when the third person jumps him, he's in fear? He's already got a knife out. No, if I, if I may try to, to answer that question, uh, Justice Link. The, the, um, I submit that the facts in the trial record support the position that Billy was, first of all, the, the trial judge recognized that Joe was provoked by Billy's violence against uh, Claudine. Yes, so, as to so, Billy. As to Billy, and, and so following that, Joe, Billy runs, Billy trips and falls. Joe is there with him. And stabs him in the back. On the ground. Now, Billy is on the ground, and Joe stabs him one time where he had to be closer than arm's length to Billy, who was on the ground. Yeah. This is from Billy's testimony. Now, Billy also says that when he got up, there was no one near him. I submit that a reasonable interpretation of the facts established that Joe, having been provoked, catches Billy because he fell. He's on the ground. Joe stabs him once, and then Joe lets Billy go. Billy gets up, and Van, having stabbed Jules, takes off after Billy, who Joe let go. At some point near that sequence, Ryan jumps Joe in sudden combat from behind. I submit that you can't attach yourself to someone's back by facing your target. It was a sudden, violent onslaught in a dark location, in a location where, where, where Joe Spinucci is not familiar with. He had already been provoked once. Now, I'm not saying that, 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 that Billy's provocation applies here. What I'm suggesting is that Ryan's provocation of Billy warranted a provocation instruction. 
what, what we're asking is, is that a trier of fact make the determination whether Joe was provoked a second time by Ryan. But do, do, does, Justice Link said, you need to have something about that there was a threat of serious harm being um, uh, produced by Ryan. Yes, correct? I I understand, uh, uh, Your Honor. I that, think that there's yeah. So he jumps on his back, but well, we know afterwards he he had no weapons on him, and I I don't. So so how do you get to the the multiple knife? <laughs> well, he, <coughs> I, I think it's 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 a complicated sequence of of the overlap of 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 uh, provocation law and the application of, of, of it to, to the facts of, 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 of each case. And where does it turn into excessive use of force and self-defense? I'm that sorry? Is it ex are you suggesting it's excessive use of force and self-defense? No, 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 I'm not. What I'm suggesting is, is that the, the case law reminds us that provocation can arise from the application of force by, by the hands alone or by the legs alone. That would be... Uh, um, uh, uh, Butcher and, and, and Keo remind us of that. So what we have in, in, in this mo at this moment, I mean, if, if you think about what it takes to get onto someone's back, um, th that's an act of violence. And that, number one. And then number two, what does it take to stay on someone's back? It takes we violence. Don't, we don't know how long he stayed on his back. You we, just said so. We don't know how long he stayed on his back, but we know it was we long. We know he threw him off. I'm sorry? And we know he threw him off. And then... That is correct. And the stabbing uh, took place by that, at least one, if not two people. Yes, that is correct. But I think the case law recognizes that once provocation uh, <coughs> arises in, in, in the defendant, that you must... Look at the case, look at the facts, and make a reasonable inference. Was there a provocative moment? And all reasonable inferences must resolve in favor of the defendant. The, the, if any view of the evidence supports the giving of a provocation instruction, uh, uh, then, then a provocation instruction but, but must be I guess that, that's getting to my question. Is it just the fact of a provocative mo moment, as you say, or does one take into account the nature of the provocation in relationship to the kind of force used by the defendant? I think there's less connection between the provocation and the amount of force used. We have cases, uh, again, in, in, in Butcher and, and, and Keogh, where uh, slight but sufficient provocation brought about re re multiple stab wounds. In, 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 in Butcher, uh, the individual was the, the, the sequence is that the, the, there were two groups of people, strangers. One, one is driving a car, the defendant stands in front of the victim driver of the car and blocks his, his egress or access just to be a pain. Uh, the victim drives off, turns around, comes back, gets out of the car, and kicks the defendant once. Because of the setting, because of the circumstances, the, but the judge refused to give a provocation instruction, and this, that case was reversed because there was sufficient evidence of provocation to warrant a provocation instruction. It's not sufficient provocation to demand a manslaughter verdict. It's, it's to give the trier of fact the opportunity to make that determination. And I think what we have here is not only do we have an instance that is, that is like Butcher in, in the sense of, of, of a single act of, 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 of provocation, we, we have that in our case, uh, there are two, Joe was, Joe was provoked by two different people. But I'm not asking the court to recognize that there was, that, that, that Billy's provocation is part of what I'm arguing here. I'm arguing here that, that, that Ryan's provocation was sufficient under the law and under the inferences it must be applied to give the pro to, to warrant the provocation instruction. And, and I would also say that the, um, uh, it's the setting, it's, it's the 
the nature of, of, of the, the, the provocation or the, of the conduct, the violence committed, that brings us to the whole notion, the whole, the, the whole concept of provocation that goes back as far as, as the Webster case. In, in Webster, um, we, are, we are told, reminded, that it says that when every man, every man when assailed with violence or great rudeness, with, inspires the defendant with a sudden impulse of anger and in an absence of time for cooling, that, that the violence that erupts is done through the heat of blood and the violence of anger. And though while it cannot be excused, if, it's, if, it's, if the jury so finds, then there has to be culpability, but not to the level of murder. So what degree? Well, may I um, direct you to one other factor here? According to the medical examiner, uh, the deep fatal wounds could not have been uh, inflicted by the defendant's three-inch knife. So that, that what are correct. you making of that in this appeal? Well, I thank you for the question. And the, uh, that uh, will hopefully afford me an opportunity to, to move into the, to, the, to the business that I brought to, to, to the court on, on the question of um, um, the Berry case. Uh, but, but just a moment before getting to that, I would, I would like to also just say that um, the key, and then I'll move on because this is what I was hoping to get to with the questions, but um, the Keogh case reminds us that uh, if the conditions are such that, that a, a, a trier of fact could make out this sequence, then, then a manslaughter instruction at least ought to be given, and that is that if it's, a, if it's a senseless encounter between two groups, that if the defendant had the weapon and didn't go off to get a, what, to retrieve a weapon and come back there, thereby having cooled off, that if the victim is grabbed in sudden combat, then um, uh, heat of passion ought to the question of, of fact ought to be, does the heat of passion negate malice? And in, 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 the, in the Keogh case, this court uh, uh, affirmed a trial court's reduction of second degree murder to manslaughter because those conditions were ripe for a recognition that provocation Control that that that. Level. But if if the facts, well, let me ask. Let, let me give you a scenario which may or may not which be what happened here. But if the defendant has just stabbed Billy, uh, and maybe standing over Billy, and somebody then jumps on his back, arguably to prevent further stabs, and that may not have been what the evidence plays. I have not gone to the transcript. Uh, is that? Does that, is that a mitigating element if he then goes on to stab the person who jumped on his back? Well, if I may answer that, number one, that there's no evidence in the transcript that such was the case. The evidence, the inferences that can be drawn are that Billy ran off, Van chased him, and at, at some point, Jules jumped, <clears throat> strike that, Ryan jumped Joe. And so okay. there was, okay. there was so no, so it was not, there was, it was no not, it interference. Was, so of, it was not conduct. done to prevent him from further stabbing. That's correct. But it was done after he had stabbed his friend. That's correct. And does that matter in terms of mitigation? I, I submit that the that's a that's something that the 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 the, 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 the jury should have to to to, to uh, 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 consider because. We, we know, and this is somewhat complicated, because we know that, that the judge gave a provocation instruction because of, Billy, or because of Billy's conduct towards Claudine. There, therefore, Joe had some mitigating reasons for s assaulting Billy, right. so, I mean, but he I... did only once with a superficial wound. 
which, if I may, uh, so there's no evidence that, that, that what you're proposing, in fact, is what happened. And secondly, the trial judge made no finding of that in a pro se motion. There was no finding that, that, that there was any sort of, of uh, conduct by Ryan, uh, that, by Ryan that was uh, somehow to be perceived in defense of Billy. It was, it, it, there was no, there was no facts in the record, there was no trial evidence, and there was no finding by the trial judge. So, having said that, if I may now uh, respond to the question from, from Justice Hines, I cited to, to the Berry case because while Berry is not a joint venture case, the concurrence in Berry invited me to consider the following, that where you have a situation where um, Joe is called into sudden combat with Ryan, um, then um, looking at the, at the surrounding circumstances, we know that this was a completely chance encounter after the fireworks had, had, had ended. It was completely by chance. Danielle encounters Billy um, by chance, chastising him for selling drugs to her younger brother. Um, this, this, was no, this was not a plan of any kind whatsoever. The, the, and, and, and then Ryan and Jules line up with, with Billy. This was also not part of any conceived plan that, that, that the defendants could have uh, conceived of. And then because of, I submit, Barry applies for this reason, that because of the weapon, because an inference of malice instruction was given against uh, the, the defense in, 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 the, in the trial, because of the inference of malice. your client had a weapon also. I'm sorry? Your client had a weapon also. Yes, but that's not dispositive of, of, of the cases that, that I'm going to, or to, to the, the Barry case, if I may uh, try to explain that. The, the, um, I'm saying because of the inference of malice instruction, which is standard uh, 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 procedure, I'm saying because of that, because Joe was provoked, because that Van was not called into the, into the, into the encounter with, 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 with Ryan by Joe, that because of the instruction, the jury ought to have been instructed to find that did whether Joe knew that Van had a six-inch blade in response to Justice Hines, because his was only a three-inch blade, and the six-inch blade is what the, 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 the You're not the, arguing he didn't know that he had a knife. You're just talking about he didn't know how long a knife he had? No, I'm arguing both, Your Honor. I'm arguing that, that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a hearsay argument that I'm, I will hopefully get to, but what I want to do is just say, justify my, my request that, that Barry be considered here is because because Joe didn't know that Van had a six-inch blade. There's no. What point did he not know? He already he he stabbed Billy, um, and uh, at the same time, it seems like Van is stabbing uh, Jules. Correct. So but and and they're there together. Where's that physically in relation to Billy? They, they're 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 feet or, or or yards apart. Right. And so you're saying so by before he turns to stabbing, um, Ryan. the Ryan, the decedent. He has to know that Van has a knife. The, 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 because I, Van I has just finished stabbing Jules. I submit that, that, that after Joe let Billy go, that when Ryan jumped Billy, that Joe was completely preoccupied with him. There, there is no evidence in the trial record that, 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 Van, that Joe ever saw the blade. There's no evidence in the record that Joe knew that, that it was never shown to Joe. It, 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 and so I'm asking that Barry be applied because in the joint venture sense, assuming provocation can, can, can uh, uh, warrant a new, uh, a new trial because a, a, warrant, a provocation instruction should have been given, Barry, because he was found guilty of, of, of uh, extreme atrocity, cruelty murder, I'm su suggesting that based upon the language of, of, of Barry, that because of the unique circumstances in this case, that, that, 
Somewhere along the line, a, 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 a question of fact ought to be answered whether Joe Nuvan had a, a six inch blade with him. And, and secondarily, whether, whether he knew that, that, that Van would cause extreme suffering and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a torturous death to please his girlfriend, which the evidence in, in, in the case shows that Van was out to, 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 in some measure, if some occasion arose, that he was, he was intent on stabbing someone to please, to please uh, Danielle. And, and th this, this is, this out, I submit, is outside of Joe's culpability. Right. And so I invite the court to consider that if we get this far, that, that Barry ought to at least maybe warrant that, that in a joint venture setting, that a joint venturer ought to know whether, whether his, his, uh, his, his co-venturer uh, is intent on committing extreme atrocity cruelty murder and with what weapon. All right, thank you. And, and I thank you and I, and I rest on my brief at this point. Thank you very much. Good morning, may it please the court. Fawn Bolero Anderson, Assistant District Attorney for Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. Before you get started, could just uh, for sort of procedural background, the defendant was also convicted of second degree murder that, on, the, the on a theory of premeditation. No. No. Just second degree murder general, generally. I'm there sorry. was a confusing jury slip. It, I mean, it doesn't make sense. That's right. I don't believe, I believe. There was a jury slip in this case, and they came back not guilty with regard to the deliberate premeditation, guilty with regard to the extreme atrocity and cruelty, and guilty on second degree generally. Oh. But wasn't, wasn't the second degree one um, uh, checked off under the deliberate premeditation? That's what I thought, too. Well, it, it's the same thing. I mean, the, it would apply, the second degree would be the same regardless of its, if it's a lesser included of first degree. It just, it, the, or extreme atrocity or cruelty. There was any clarification sought from the jury as to what they had done? No, and it's really not an issue before the court. Um, well, it in theory with regard could to be Mal. an issue because if there were to be a new trial, it's not clear to me whether the jury found the defendant not guilty of deliberate premeditation or simply didn't reach the, reach the issue. I, I do believe they found them not guilty on deliberate premeditation okay. um, based on the jury instructions. How can you be guilty of murder second degree for deliberate premeditation? It's just, it's just not the right way to do it the I mean, the, the verdict form is a very strange verdict form. All right, but in any event. Uh, well, getting help, back to the help case, me, there help, would, me, there help, is, me, help me with the core issue in the case, which is the reasonable provocation. Uh, I mean, it's sort of somewhat <clears> strange <throat> that in this particular case that the pushing of Van's, the pushing of his girlfriend is viewed to be sufficient to get a provocation instruction with regard to the stabbing of Billy, but the victim's jumping on his back is not viewed as sufficient to get a reasonable provocation here. What degree of force or what degree of conduct do we say is enough to mitigate a subsequent killing? I mean, isn't that sort of the core issue, is the conduct that would mitigate a killing from first or second degree to manslaughter? That's correct. So it's the commonwealth's position, first of all, that the defendant was not entitled to a mitigating instruction with regard to the armed assault with intent to murder, um, which was the underlying charge for the defendant's conduct against Billy Ty. He w but, was or was not? Was not, that's the Commonwealth's position. He wasn't entitled to that. Well, he that got the, it nonetheless. Is and that the only one that um, defense counsel asked for? No, he asked for it um, also with regard to the murder, but if you look at the defendant's motion requesting that, the last paragraph is, of his motion states that the, the underlying evidence for that supported his request was only Billy Ty's um, assault on the defendant's girlfriend. It had nothing to do with the, jumping on the, the jumping on the back. No, this was not um, requested by the defendant at trial because it was completely at odds with his trial strategy and it wasn't supported by the evidence, the Commonwealth suggests. Um, Why was it at odds with his trial strategy? Because his trial strategy was um, 
the defendant claimed he had nothing to do with the attack on two of the three victims. He claimed his um, culpability only had to do with Billy Tai. He divorced himself totally from the attacks on um, Jewel Stevens and Ryan Sullivan, stating that his um, but he co venture didn't do them. He, he had do. he had no, he had no he did not touch them he did not stab them his co venture took that upon himself he did not have the shared state uh, of mind for those um, stabbings to occur so that was his his defense at trial and it's hard to right to, but the but the judge was instructing on joint venture I mean I, I understand he was opposing that but the judge was doing it the, so why wouldn't it have been relevant. Because it would have, he would have to, had to admit that he No, did. he doesn't have to admit anything. He just has to ask the judge for an instruction on provocation. Well, at the time, his, instruction, his request for the instruction on provocation was based on only Billy Ty's attack on his girlfriend. had nothing to do with anybody jumping on his back. He denied that happened. He knew that he moved in limine to have testimony about someone jumping on his back excluded. So he knew it was going to come into evidence, yet he never... Um, pursued that as a reason underlying his request. And the Commonwealth suggests... Sorry, I'm sorry, the defendant moved in limine to keep out of evidence the fact that the victim jumped on his back? That somebody jumped on his back. Yes, he moved in limine to keep that out of evidence. And, and, and his reason for doing that was? Speculation. And, and Th so that who, was put, who put it in? It came in through Claudine? It, it came in through Danielle, Danielle I mean. the co-venturer's girlfriend, stated when she was coming back up the scene where the stabbing was occurring, she saw somebody on the defendant's back, a male, and that the, the defendant threw him off, and that's what the trial evidence was limited to. That's it. There's no evidence of any reasonable uh, fear or subjective fear on the part of the defendant in this case, which you would need in order to trigger uh, a reasonable provocation instruction with regard to sudden combat. In this case, uh, jumping hey, on someone. I'm, I'm going to stop you there. I mean, how do you get? It's the defendant generally who's claiming that he or she, usually he, was provoked. The defendant doesn't always testify. How are you going to get into that? That that, that I was scared without the defendant testifying. Because the, the nature of the circumstances of the whole setting would justify it. Both, re um, and usually you do have a statement to the police. Like Acevedo is a great case with regard to sudden combat. In that case, you have two groups of people who were together early in the night. There's a fight between the two. There's a verbal exchange. They separate, and uh, the party comes back. And then there's a physical fight where the um, defendant himself gets um, out. He's outnumbered. He's by a group of people. He's struck over the head. And then he, in turn, uses deadly force, deadly force, swinging a knife, and ends up killing one of the people, one of the group of people who are attacking him. And this case is far different from that. There is no fear. The defendant himself. They fear, but I mean, but isn't it sufficient if somebody says, "I'm sleeping with your wife," and then he gets stabbed? Haven't, hasn't our case law said that that would be reasonable provocation? That's reasonable provocation based on heat of passion. We're talking about reasonable provocation based on sudden well, combat, where you have a physical component well, that what is. About, what about the case that Mr. Hanafi relies on, Bush? I don't know how to say it, Boucher or Boucher, which you don't cite, but I'm. What about that one? If you... Th that case is different from this case. This case is. is the uh, looking, I suggest that you can't even looking at the act alone, it, it, putting it in the defendant's um, and not looking at the entire setting. Jumping on someone's back without striking a blow or anything isn't enough to throw the person off, turn around, and start stabbing him. What we have here is he could, that could have been one of the girls jumping on his back. It's all spec. Well, the judge anyway found that it was in fact. Ryan. Right, but in so the defendant's state of mind, right? So he has to have a, a serious, there has to be a threat of serious harm. Somebody, he just finished stabbing somebody. Somebody jumps on his back, and that, I suggest to you, is an attempt to defuse the situation. You can't view that as anything other. It's not someone jumping on the back and delivering a blow from behind. This is pulling someone away from the situation. That's all that jumping on someone's back is in this situation. Um, well, you could view it differently. You could look at it as being attacked, I suppose. But there's no evidence of any hitting or there use was no, of a weapon or anything. Right, no evidence that he was struck or blow. Or, and the judge disbelieved the testimony that he was choked. 
That's correct. So at the motion for new trial stage, you can see it's a desperate attempt to get a second bite at the apple. The defendant is taking the, it's a pro se motion for new trial. The defendant is taking the evidence and um, in, in stating a different set of circumstances. And we know that because at the motion for new trial stage, the notes from the defense attorney's first meeting with the defendant were submitted. And we know that he, what he told his attorney is the defense that was um, elicited that they pursued at trial, that he had nothing to do with the attack on um, Jewel Stevens or Ryan Sullivan. But we know, but at, at the motion for new trial stage, all of a sudden he's saying he has to explain the cut on his fingers and he has to explain why he then turned his weapon on an innocent bystander. But, but there, 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 it seems that there are two separate, at least two separate issues here. One is based on the evidence at trial, was he entitled to a reasonable provocation instruction? And then the motion for new trial, I guess, says that there may have been additional evidence that that that, that the defense counsel was ineffective and in not presenting. That's right. Which would have strengthened the claim for a reasonable provocation instruction. I gather. So we really have two separate re related issues. But focusing, putting aside the motion for new trial, the and focusing just on what the evidence was at the time. I guess the other question I would have for you is the one I asked your brother. Uh, is I have some concern. I'm not sure if I can. I'm not sure exactly how, but I have some concern with the idea that if I stab your buddy, and then you come over and slug me for having stabbed your buddy, that that now means that if I kill you, it mitigates my killing of you. When what? When I, after all, I had triggered the violence. The violence by the stab by the initial stabbing. I but I don't know that I've ever seen a case which addresses that issue. No, I, I haven't either, and that is a factor that I think that has to be put into the calculus. And if you look at again drawing at the on the Acevedo case, they do look at who starts the fight and when it turns physical. In this case, the defendant brought the knives to a fist fight, and not only that, he pursued the victims who were fleeing. I just can't overlook the fact that jumping on the back in this circumstance, again, is nothing more than an attempt to defuse the situation, but taking your hypothetical into um, consideration where the defend where the the victim in this case, the deceased victim, would deliver a blow for stabbing his buddy, which is even more than what we have here. Um, it does, it, there's no sudden combat from that because the combat has already started at the behest of the defendant. Um, the situation in this case, we have, at, at all times, these three fleeing victims were outnumbered. It was three to four. You have the two, the defendant, his co-venture, and their two girlfriends who we, we know were, took part in the attack. They not only started the, the confrontation verbally, they turned it physical when, he, when Claudine, the defendant's girlfriend, punched him. And then after the fact, they go over to the Jewel Ste uh, presumably Jules Stephen, and start kicking the body while the body's down on the ground after being stabbed. So at all times, they are, the, these three victims were outnumbered. And not only outnumbered, but they n were all unarmed. Um, this is a classic extreme atrocity and cruelty case for that, for that reason because the defendant, the victim was on the ground being, and, and by all accounts, the evidence would support that he was being stabbed while he was down on the ground. Would it, would it matter to you if the evidence was that, that the victim had slugged him from behind as opposed to jumping on his back? Yes. I would have to say if there was evidence that the deceased victim had punched the, the defendant in the head from behind, it would have made a difference because that, is, that act, action is completely different than the attempt to defuse the situation. That would be only escalating the But we don't know, I mean, if the, if you characterize his jumping on the back as the attempt to defuse the situation. I don't know whether that necessarily is a, based on the, at least, it's one thing if he's, on top of Billy about to stab him again, but I gather there's at least some view of the evidence where that was not the case. Uh, but Well, you still have a, a, def a defendant who, who set ch chase against fleeing victims. There's still victims who are fleeing, and the motion for new trial judge 
rejected the defendant's claim that he saw stars and was being choked. So that's out of the calculus. Yeah, there was no evidence of that. I mean, right. I, I, all, you, all we have is, uh, yeah. is Danielle. So, you ha so, so what the request is now based on um, is all speculation. And I don't think... Well, no, you still have... I mean, put, it, put aside the motion for new trial. But, <laughs> no, but, but, but to me, the more interesting issue is, the, is whether Danielle's testimony <clears throat> by itself was sufficient to, to trigger a reasonable provocation instruction. And I maintain that it's not only be, not only because the act itself isn't enough, but especially when you look at the totality of the circumstances, that's where it certainly is not enough. And I submit that you would, you can't ignore those other facts when you're deciding whether or not this defendant was entitled to a reasonable provocation based on sudden combat uh, theory. And, and the standard we give for a judge who faces this again is. <laughs> What, this distinction between jumping on one's back versus striking somebody? I suggest it's a substantial, oh, with regard to whether or not there was a threat of serious harm, that standard, or the substantial likelihood of a no, miscarriage no. of justice? No, no, basically, when you're entitled to this instruction, I mean, it's, it's a fine line that you're seeking to draw, and I wonder where you're drawing the line and whether the line is focused on whether it's a punch as opposed to a grab, or whether the issue is whether or not this is the type of conduct that the law says properly mitigates a killing to manslaughter. I mean, that ultimately is what is at issue here, is the law says some conduct by the victim mitigates the severity of the killing. I think the standard is the threat of serious harm. And I would even suggest that some of the cases talk about and a duty to retreat, and I know that bleeds over into the self-defense realm, but the cases still, when they do talk about sudden combat, have mentioned that there was a duty to retreat. Uh, and in this case, the defendant, through, if we believe the evidence from Danielle, we know that someone jumped on his back, presumably Ryan, based on, a, uh, based on the evidence, and then turned around and started stabbing him while he was on the ground. He was able to throw him off. There was no evidence. The, Danielle didn't testify that there was any struggle in between the point when someone jumped on his back and he threw him off. Did she also testify to uh, seeing him, him stab? Uh, no, the, um, neither of the girls testified to having seen a knife at all. So um, what we know is that the defendant's girlfriend her, him, herself says that she saw the defendant and the co-venturer, both over the body um, that was on the ground that was struggling. The feet were moving, and they were making arm, both were moving their arms, but she denied seeing any, any weapon. And we also have evidence that- But I'm sorry, but they saw the, the blows that apparently were the, were the stabbing. That's them. right. She did see the blows. That, um, that's Claudine. That's Claudine. And we, we also know that um, Billy Ty's stepfather, who interrupted the stabbing, puts the defendant, who was the white male, over Ryan's body. So putting two, to two, two and two together, we know that the defendant was actively stabbing the, this victim based on the eyewitness testimony, but that we, don't, we have other evidence. We have the DNA evidence. We have uh, the defendant's blood on, DNA on Ryan's shorts. In addition, if you look at the exhibits, the, the photographs, this defendant suffered very deep wounds to his thumb and his finger right here where you would um, where you would injure yourself by stabbing someone else and we got to, we had testimony at trial that showed that stabbing someone once wouldn't wouldn't automatically give you those wounds those wounds happen when either the blood the knife becomes so bloody that the hand slips down it or the knife itself hits bone or something else and causes the hand to slip up. The defendant himself, he, he says he stabbed Billy Ty. That was a super, superficial wound. He didn't suffer those deep cuts on his finger from stabbing Billy Ty. The Commonwealth suggests that it, he suffered those wounds from stabbing the victim, Ryan Sullivan, in this case. And Ryan Sullivan suffered 13 stab wounds while he was still conscious. Now, two of them could have been fatal, right? One to the left chest and one to the left ab abdomen. That's right. And one of them was seven inches deep, and one was five inches deep. That's right. Now, what did the medical examiner say? Was it that um, the shorter knife could or could not have caused those wounds? The medical examiner said that he, they could have. He could not tell which knife uh, 
caused which wound because the nature of a struggle, the body is moving. So, um, did he say anything that it was more likely to have been the more? The, he said it could be either. It could be either, and also because of the force when you push on someone's body, the body automatically compresses, so it can go in further than when you're measuring it flat. I thought he basically said, or she, I don't remember which, um, did not believe that the seven inch wound, which is only one of the two fatal wounds, uh, was caused by a three inch knife. I believe that's in the de defendant's um, brief. I think that if you read the testimony at trial and it was Dr. Zane, it, it is less equivocal than, than that. Um, he does say it is more, maybe more likely, but I don't think he even goes that far. Um, it, there is no evidence as to which knife caused which wound. But it's clear that there were different knives used. There were two knives used, the Commonwealth suggests, and the knives were never recovered. Forensics support that? They could not say that. Okay. Um, but there, because there were, we know there's two people stabbing, the Commonwealth submits there were two knives used. The knives were never recovered. The length of the knives were attributed solely to the testimony from the girlfriends who said they see, have seen knives on these defendants and, and, before. And, and didn't one of those knives come from, didn't the defendant's knife come from his girlfriend's house? Claudine, that's right. The defendant's knife came from Claudine. She was carrying a knife and he, her testimony was that he took it away from her because he didn't want her to have the knife. So then put a knife in his possession. If, if I could turn you to one question with regard sure. to the stabbing of Jules. Yes. Uh, was the jury instructed that they need to show that the defendant knew that Jules had a knife? No, the jury was not, but the comment that, that the co-defendant did. No. That, that, the co that, 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 that the defendant Van Gustav. knew that Jules was armed. That Van Gustav was armed. The I'm sorry, the Van Gustav was yeah, right, I got the That's right. correct. Um, no, there was not that explicit um, instruction, but the Commonwealth suggests there was no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice and would turn you to the record, sub supplemental rec record appendix, page 12, where the judge instructed the jury, in a joint venture, a person is guilty if he or she intentionally par participates with another in the commission of the crime as something he or she wishes to bring about and seeks by his or her actions to make it succeed. In this case, we have a stabbing. With, and if uh, on a joint venture theory, if you have to have joint venture and you have to have, uh, have intent for that stabbing to occur, you have to know that your co-venture is armed with a knife, otherwise you can't have a stabbing. So that knowledge instruction is subsumed within the joint venture instructions, and in any event, this really wasn't an issue at trial. The, the defendant um, did not object to the omission of this instruction. The what, evidence what was, was strong. Was the conviction of assault what was the conviction of? AVDW SBI, so assault with a dangerous weapon that resulted in substantial. Was that a lesser included or was that one that is charged? As charged. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll take our morning break.